on the off chance that there are those of you out there watching right now who don't know who I am since somebody has been a little bit lacking with the updates on this channel, I'm Matt's evil twin. Basically, I'm the opposite of everything that Matt is. I am anathema to him. Did I really just use the word anathema? Is that really in the script? So, for all of the storytelling mediums that are talked about on this channel, books, movies, plays, etc., there is one medium of storytelling that has been relatively untouched, and so I am here to fill that niche. I am going to talk about television. And I know that there are a bunch of you that are saying, Oh, television's just mindless crap. Television's making us stupid. Television's being replaced by the internet. It's obsolete. Well, I say to ye, shut up. Ye too? Really? Is my character even remotely threatening anymore? Because I am here to tell you why television is a great medium of storytelling, from half-hour episodes to hour episodes to whole series and seasons, or whatever you call it, wherever you live. There are some great stories being told in really excellent ways, and we are going to look at some of the best of the best. At least in my opinion, and let's face it, my opinion is pretty much right. So, without further ado, let's get started. Mexico, we work. What time is it, kids? A honeymooner! We're terribly happy to have all of you with us. What's today's date? The date started 47988. 47988. Captain, what's wrong? 47988. I'm not sure. I don't know how or why, but I'm moving back and forth through time. Growing up, one of my favorite shows to watch was Star Trek The Next Generation. This is not a fact I'm particularly proud of. My parents are both fans of the show, and although I was pretty young at the time and was often supposed to be tucked in and asleep by the time the show was on, some evenings would often find me sneaking out of bed and going to the kitchen to watch the episodes where I thought that my parents couldn't see me, though apparently I wasn't nearly as stealthy as I thought I was. So most of my next-gen experience came from watching the show in syndication or on the various VHS tapes where my parents had recorded they, they don't know what VHS tapes are. It, 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 it's like old-fashioned TiVo. This meant that there were some episodes that I watched and remembered better than others, and one of those episodes was the final episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, the episode that we're going to look at specifically today called All Good Things. Dot, dot, dot. In this episode, the ever-enigmatic Captain Jean-Luc Picard finds himself traveling to three distinct periods in his life. Seven years in the past, before his first mission with the USS Enterprise to Farpoint Station, in the present, where the episode starts, and many, many years into the future, when Picard is retired and is suffering from a debilitating mental illness, not unlike Alzheimer's, and the rest of the crew is scattered throughout the galaxy. He later learns that a temporal anomaly has appeared in the neutral zone and is threatening the very existence of mankind. Also, Picard's old nemesis Q shows up. Well, this time I'm not your enemy. I'm not the one that causes the annihilation of mankind. You are. Me. That's right. You're doing it right now. You did it before, and you'll do it yet again. The final episodes for series are often very difficult, because if you're doing a final episode as opposed to the last episode before the series is cancelled, then your show probably has a decent following, and each one of those followers has his or her own ideas of how the series should end. And TNG is really the only Star Trek series that had a final episode where the end game was not really known, or at least couldn't be predicted. Like with DS9, we knew that the final episode was going to deal with the conclusion of the war with Dominion. With Voyager, we knew it was going to involve Voyager getting home. With Enterprise, we knew it was going to deal with the formation of the United Federation of Planets. But the structure of Next Generation was very reminiscent of the structure of the original Star Trek series, which didn't actually have a final episode because they made their last episode before they knew the series was going to be cancelled. Their last episode was just another episode. Unless you count Star Trek The Motion Picture, which I basically do. But TNG was just basically a series of space adventures with no real overarching storyline. There were some character arcs and some character growth with characters like Worf and Data and Picard, and some of the stuff from DS9 did bleed into the final episodes of TNG, but for the most part, it was very episodic. 
So how do you end this very popular but very episodic series of space adventures? The answer lies with the very first episode. In this case, Encounter at Farpoint, which features Picard's first encounter with the entity known as Q. Q made it onto my list of the top 15 most likable villains a few years ago, and he is basically this being who has the powers of a god. He's omnipotent and omniscient, and he shows up to put humanity on trial. Picard then has to prove that humanity has grown beyond its barbarian roots and has become largely peaceful and benevolent. He does so successfully, but Q keeps popping back about once per season to give Picard a little shove in his morality and test him again. So here it is, seven years later, and we learn during the course of this episode that the entire seven seasons of Star Trek The Next Generation has essentially been an extension of that first trial. The Q Continuum have been watching Picard and his crew over the last seven years and watching them grow and develop. So basically, they end a story arc that we didn't even know existed. They give us a glimpse of Picard and his crew and where they got started, in addition to giving us some good first season nostalgia and bringing back characters like Tasha Yar and Miles O'Brien, and also look at where the crew might be headed, looking at how the different crew members ended up 25 years in the future, with Riker becoming an admiral, Crusher getting her own ship, Data becoming a professor and using contractions, stuff like that. So the focus of this episode, as it is with many of the latest Star Trek episodes is not so much on the events of the episode, but rather on the characters, the different crews at different points in time, and how their relationship with Picard develops. If it were anyone else but you, we wouldn't even be here. I think the writers were faced with a small problem in writing the Next Generation series. With the original series, it was basically your typical three-way fight between the good guys, the bad guys, and the law, which in this case was Starfleet. So you have Captain Kirk being on the side of the law, but often playing the vigilante and doing what he feels is right in his own unorthodox way and damn the consequences. But at that time, the Federation of Planets was still relatively new and the galaxy was still largely unexplored. By the time TNG rolls around, 80 years have passed, and the show needs to reflect the changes that would occur during that time. So in addition to Kirk and his crew being legends to these people, the Klingons are no longer a big bad, Starfleet is more firmly established, the rules are more firmly established, peace is more firmly established, and we know a lot more. And as a result, the sort of vigilante actions that Kirk undertook are no longer tolerated. In short, we have become comfortable. So how can we shake this comfortable world up a little bit? That's where Q comes in. Q basically points out that we've gotten so used to maintaining the moral high ground that we've forgotten how to defend it, and that when we're thrown into a really unfamiliar situation, we still have the sort of shoot first and ask questions later attitude that our barbarian ancestors had. And though Picard proves him wrong in that instance, in that first episode, Q keeps coming back and keeps watching and keeps nudging Picard and his crew and getting them to rise above themselves and their inferiority. And seven years later, we have to conclude that the Enterprise, and Picard in particular, have gotten pretty comfortable, pretty complacent. And so Q gives them another test, something that is continually referred to as an anomaly, an aberration, something unusual, something out of the ordinary, something that they are not familiar with. Something that goes against everything that common sense says can be true, namely the fact that this anomaly grows backwards in time. It was created in the future, and the effects move backwards. And one thing that is made clear with Picard's time traveling is that he no longer has to earn his crew's trust in the present. When he tells his present-day crew that he's traveling back and forth in time, they believe him. Or at least they believe him to the point where they're willing to test it out and see that he is in fact telling the truth. And when he tells them to go into the neutral zone to look at the anomaly, and when he tells them to go into the anomaly in order to destroy it, they don't even question him, because they have come to trust him, which is why, as we progress through the episode, the scenes in the present grow shorter and shorter. In the past and the future is a very different story. The crew in the past don't trust him yet. They don't know him yet, and so when he starts making completely unreasonable orders and having them do all of these weird things, they're very hesitant to follow those orders. And when he orders them to do something that will endanger the safety of the ship and crew, they won't do it without an explanation. And in the future, Picard is suffering from what's called Eremotic syndrome, which is a mentally debilitating disease. Now, it hasn't really taken effect yet at this point in the episode, but everyone knows that it could take effect at any time. And so, of course, when Picard starts talking about traveling through time and all of this temporal anomaly and the neutral zone stuff, then the crew naturally thinks that, well, 
the disease is starting to get to him now. He's going senile. And even when they do go along with what he's saying, it's kind of just humoring him, saying, well, he's Jean-Luc Picard, and if he wants to go on one more mission, that's what we're going to do. And so Q's role in all this is to get Picard out of his comfort zone, to get him to think, to get him to not be complacent. And it's only in looking at the past, the present, and the future together that Picard is able to figure out a solution to the problem. Three pulses. Three time periods. Converging to one point in space. Now, the Star Trek series are traditionally about the captains. That's why they get top billing. Yes, there are episodes that focus on certain members of the crew, but ultimately the series as a whole are about the captains. So it only makes sense that the episode would focus so exclusively on Picard. Yes, we see how the other characters change too, but Picard is the focus. And so Picard, who started out at the beginning of the series so cold in the Louvre, ends up well, slightly less cold in the Louvre, but still not really connecting to his crew. And when he sees his own future and where he ends up, he decides that it is time to change a few things in his life and to look beyond himself and his own comfort. Perhaps not as drastic a change as Scrooge underwent in A Christmas Carol, but still a pretty decent change nonetheless. And it's one that completes his own story arc for the series very nicely, as he discovers an aspect of human existence in himself that he hadn't really thought about before. Now, at one point, Q says that what you were and what you are to become will always be with you. And he means that as a sort of cryptic hint that his time traveling will show him the answer to the problem. But there's actually something kind of profound about that statement, too. Because in a sense, we are constantly living with what has happened to us in the past and what will or might happen to us in the future. And that's why A Christmas Carol stresses the importance of living in the past, the present, and the future. And in a way, so does this episode. Final episodes, in their own way, kind of stand on the brink between past and future. If you're looking at a final episode of a series that has become beloved, you are remembering where these characters came from from the very first episode and how far they have come since then. And at the same time, you're also wondering what's going to happen to these characters after the series ends. How are they going to continue to develop in the future? All Good Things shows us that in a very real sense, while also showing us some of the might-have-beens with these characters. And in its own way, it really is the perfect possible ending that this series could have had. A lot of those last episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation were also to set up some of the problems that were being faced in DS9 and some of the problems that would be faced in Star Trek Voyager, which would come out the next year, but I like that the final episode really does bring it back to Next Generation. It keeps it very Next Generation-centric, and I think it served this series in the best possible way.